The uh, committee will come to order. This is a hearing entitled Examining Obamacare's Hidden Marriage Penalty and Its Impact on the Deficit. I will uh, recognize uh, myself for an opening statement and then the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Over the past several months, this committee has heard from job creators regarding the negative impact the President's health care law is having and will continue to have on hiring and job growth. In addition to the impact on job creators, the new law will also negatively impact individuals. The Affordable Care Act contains refundable tax subsidies to assist certain people in purchasing health insurance. The Congressional Budget Office estimates these tax subsidies are the most expensive component of the law. The tax subsidies begin in 2014, and by 2017, CBO projects the tax subsidies will add $100 billion to the national debt each year with an escalating cost into the future. The CBO estimates three-quarters of this cost will be new government spending. These tax subsidies are available to individuals who do not receive health insurance through their place of work. Instead of only being available for individuals not receiving employee-sponsored health care, any individual within a certain income range, uh, it would be more effective if the tax code did not care whether people receive their health insurance at work or purchase it in the private market. Two households with the same number of children, same number of wage earners, and same combined levels of income are otherwise the same except for the source of health insurance. These two households should not have tax bills that differ by thousands of dollars because of their choice of health care. With so many families struggling throughout the country, and especially in my home state of South Carolina, we should not be working towards ensuring families, we should be working towards ensuring families have the tools to invest in their health. The Joint Committee on Tax has estimated that less than 20 percent of the beneficiaries of the tax subsidy will be married couples and their families. This is partly due to a recent HHS rule that prevents families from accessing the tax subsidy if either parent has an offer of coverage at work. In other words, if a husband is offered health insurance at work for just himself and his wife and children must go purchase health insurance in the open market, the cost of covering the wife and children would not be eligible for a subsidy. This rule is meant to minimize the cost of the subsidy, but the collateral damage will be that the Affordable Care Act will exacerbate the marriage penalty already in the tax code. Over time, this act will force couples to choose not to get married because the sizable tax benefit that will only be available if they stay unmarried. In addition to the penalty against marriage in the act, several of the witnesses before us today have conducted research that demonstrates the cost of the health care law will likely be much higher than the Congressional Budget Office originally projected. From underestimating the cost of the long-term care program demonstrated by the administration's decision to eliminate the program to the law's likely unsustainable Medicare cuts, the tax subsidies in the law will be the biggest reason the law will exceed the projected cost. Because this biased tax credit will encourage employers to discontinue health insurance and employees to decline health-sponsored, employer-sponsored coverage, the cost of the health care law will continue to increase. In contrast to CBO's prediction, several surveys predict the number of employers who cease to offer health insurance to their employees will be much higher than it is now. Just last week, it was reported the Nation's largest private employer, Walmart, will no longer offer health care to new employees working less than 24 hours per week. Additionally, employees working 24 to 34 hours per week will not be offered insurance for their spouses. This is an example of how government mandates and regulations are significantly increasing the price of health insurance and companies must make adjustments to compete globally. As more and more companies cut back on health insurance coverage, the cost of the Affordable Care Act will increase. It is essential we explore the unintended costs associated with the new health care law. We need laws that are transparent and uniform in their impact on families. As the health care law is implemented, we must examine how we are using taxpayer dollars and if government is being a good steward of those dollars. One of the President's Fiscal Commission guiding values was to reduce inefficiencies, loopholes, and the complexity in the tax code in order to lower rates, simplify the tax code, and bring down the deficit. As demonstrated with problems with the tax credits, the Affordable Care Act moves in precisely the opposite direction. The Act introduces another major inequity into the tax code, effectively encouraging employers and workers to drop employer-sponsored insurance and pass these costs to taxpayers. Additionally, the law adds a large marriage tax penalty and discourages job growth. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about what they have learned about the health care law and whether I am right to be skeptical about how the law will play out. Uh, at this point, I would recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for calling 
this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for coming to participate. For many years, I have been an avid uh, supporter and advocate of a national health plan. And I have been that because I have always believed, since I learned about health, that health care ought to be a right and not a privilege. Nor do I believe that it can be left to chance, because it is obviously too precious. When you think about it, without good health care, students cannot concentrate at school, families cannot pursue work and other activities that are needed to develop and sustain what we call a good life. So when the opportunity came to vote on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, I was delighted. And I was delighted because it has provided various pathways to accessible health care for the masses. One such path establishes State-based health care exchanges that can be utilized by individuals if they cannot find coverage through their large employer. Small businesses are the Medicaid expansion. The subsidies vary with income and are based upon the Federal poverty level. A similar eligibility threshold for numerous government programs. In addition, Further tax credits will be available to those eligible for employer coverage and public assistance coverage, but only in narrow circumstances. The ACA will benefit families and reduce the Federal deficit. First of all, the families and individuals impacted by crippling medical debt, that is a significant causation of personal bankruptcies will become a thing of the past, because preventative care and early detection are no longer cost prohibitive. Secondly, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office found the health care legislation will reduce deficits by $143 billion, further benefiting our Nation's finances. As I have previously said, the ACA is progress. And while each individual will face unique circumstances and challenges under ACA, generally there are significant benefits that result in good health for the American public. <coughs> Every time I think of the fact that more than 32 million additional people will have the opportunity to purchase, maintain, and make use of health insurance, I say that is good for me, and I believe that that is good for America. And so I thank our witnesses for coming, and again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding the hearing, and I yield back. I uh, thank the gentleman from Illinois. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Uh, I would now ask unanimous consent that the uh, staff report entitled Uncovering the True Impact of the Obamacare Tax Credits be included in the record. Uh, Chairman, I, I have no objection, but I would also like to make sure if we could, that the report is reflected as a partisan staff report and has not been marked up. Um, so as long as we make sure that that depiction is shown, I would have no objection. Uh, the distinguished gentleman from Illinois' comments uh, are obviously part of the record and can be read in conjunction with the report. And um, with that, uh, Chairman, yes, sir. I just, I just want to be clear. Uh, the, the staff, we got the report about ten minutes ago, and I wondered is that a is that a is that a report of the committee, or is that a report of the Republican side of the committee? Since we had no input, and I think that's what. Uh, the ranking member Davis was trying to get to. I mean, we, just, we, don't, we haven't even read it. The uh, uh, gentleman from Maryland is correct. It is a report of the Republican staff. It is not the committee uh, as a whole. The gentleman is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, without objection, uh, so ordered with the uh, comments of uh, uh, the gentleman from Illinois and the gentleman from Maryland. 
We will now welcome our first uh, panel of witnesses. On behalf of all of us, thank you for coming and welcome. I will introduce you from my left to right, your right to left, and that will be the order in which uh, we would uh, like you to uh, give your opening remarks. Uh, Douglas Holtz Eakin is President of the American Action Forum and former Director of the Congressional Budget Office. Diana Furchgott Roth is a Senior Fellow with the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Richard Burkhauser is a Professor of Economics at Cornell University. Sarah Collins is Vice President for Affordable Health Insurance at the Commonwealth Fund. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify, so I would ask if you would please uh, rise and lift your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. The lights, and I know many of you have testified before and you are more familiar with the process than I am. So the lights mean what they traditionally mean in light, mean in life, green, go, yellow, speed up, try to get under the red light before it changes, and red, kind of see if you can start bringing it to a conclusion. Uh, and with that, we will recognize Mr. holtz -Eakin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. It is a privilege to be able to be here today to discuss this important topic. Uh, there are many perspectives on uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, um, in mine, I, I want to focus on some of the economic consequences of this legislation. Uh, viewed from the perspective of economic policy, I believe this is an unwise legislation at this point in our Nation's history. And let me uh, uh, spell out a couple of reasons why. Uh, first and foremost, as the Committee is well aware, uh, the U.S. faces a daunting fiscal future uh, in which projected debt relative to the economy uh, is under current law to spiral ever upward and invite a sovereign debt crisis of the type that we are watching unfold in Europe at this very moment. Uh, in such circumstances, uh, the, the law's uh, budgetary consequences are of, of extreme importance, and it is my belief that it will exacerbate, not improve the fiscal outlook, and for that reason is a dramatic step in the wrong direction. Uh, we, know, we knew at the time of its passage that the law contained many budget gimmicks which disguised its true impact on, on future deficits. Uh, we have already seen the unwinding of one of those, the so-called Class Act, which was used uh, in the first 10 years to provide $80 billion worth of revenue and, and hit all the spending past the budget window. Uh, but there were others as well. As the Chairman mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, there are uh, billions of dollars of cuts to Medicare which uh, will not be sustainable in the future. Uh, the, the business model for Medicare has not changed in a way that will allow those cuts to uh, be implemented. A future Congress will be faced with the, the choice between uh, it, denying uh, seniors access to care or restoring those cuts. Uh, my, my expectation is those cuts will be restored. The cost of the program will uh, become larger and larger. And uh, as one of the, my fellow witnesses, Dr. Burkhauser, has uh, done extensive research on, uh, there is the, the serious upside risk of the insurance subsidies offered to the exchanges being far more uh, expensive than the Congressional Budget Office originally estimated. Uh, there is simply too much subsidy money on the table for employers and employees not to take advantage of it, and we will see a reworking of many uh, employment contracts so that uh, employers no longer offer coverage and the, uh, the uh, workers go get their insurance subsidies. So I, I think budgetarily this is very dangerous. Second perspective is from what we know about those countries that have huge deficit problems and, and poor economic growth, and the U.S. is in that position, the playbook for success is one which keeps taxes low and reforms them to be simpler and more pro-growth and then cut spending, in particular uh, government employment, not a big deal in the U.S., and transfer programs. Uh, this legislation goes exactly in the wrong direction from the lessons of economic history. Uh, it has uh, you know, five to $700 billion worth of tax increases, depending on how you count it. It makes the tax code, as the Chairman mentioned, far more complex, not simpler, and more pro-growth. And so from a tax perspective, it goes exactly the wrong direction. And this is uh, additional transfer spending in the United States uh, and, and expansions of Medicaid, uh, probably our least successful entitlement program, the invention of a new entitlement and the insurance subsidies, uh, both of those are steps in the wrong direction given the, the needs that face the United States. So um, I, I think that um, it is broadly 
uh, a step that is dangerous to our future budgetarily and from a, a growth perspective. And finally, if you look inside the, the law at some of the incentives, uh, they have perverse anti-growth Im implications. Uh, the, the tax credits available to small businesses, for example, penalize those small businesses that actually grow and add employees or increase their compensation. Uh, the insurance subsidies themselves uh, get phased out as people's income rises. That is an implicit tax on the success of our low-income workers and at odds with our desire to allow them to get ahead. Uh, and uh, lastly, I, I think the, the labor market consequences of uh, the higher insurance market premiums that the law will inevitably produce uh, by demanding more benefits get covered and um, uh, applying taxes to uh, all parts of the, the, uh, the health uh, supply chain, plus the, the cost of the employer mandate itself, uh, are going to hurt low-wage workers in particular, harm the ability of all workers at this point in time to, uh, to get jobs. And so taken as a whole, from the, the top level macroeconomics to the labor market incentives, I think this is dramatically bad economic policy and will, uh, in the end, be something that the United States regrets. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holsey. Uh, Ms. Fershkot Roth. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify here today. I am a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and I am the author of Women's Figures, an Illustrated Guide to the Economic Progress of Women in America that looks at how women have moved increasingly into the workforce over the past uh, uh, half century. Uh, I fully agree that everybody should have access to health care, but the way this bill is structured, there are disincentives for women to marry and disincentives for women to work. And for a bill that is supposed to make Americans healthier, these disincentives are truly startling. Beginning in 2014, when the bill takes effect, Americans will find it more advantageous to say, stay single than to marry, uh, even more so than under the current tax code. Marriage penalties from taxes in general and from the new health care law in particular fall into two categories, disincentives to marry and disincentives to work. And the way the new health care law is structured, health insurance premium credits in the new law are linked not directly to income but to the poverty line resulting in a particularly steep marriage penalty for low-income Americans. And this arises because with $10,890 as the poverty line for one person and an additional $3,820,000 for a spouse, marriage means less government help with health insurance when a couple gets married. Since the new qualified benefit plans offered in the health insurance exchanges are going to be generous, and expensive, with no lifetime maximums, no co-payments for preventive services, no exclusions for pre-existing conditions, and the requirement to accept all applicants, it is going to be especially important for low-income individuals to have help with their health insurance premiums. So here is how the system will work when it is implemented in 2014. The new health care bill will offer refundable advance premium credits to singles and families with incomes of between 133 percent and 400 percent of the poverty line. The credits can only be used to buy health insurance through the exchanges. So if you earn up to 133 percent of the poverty line, your premium can only be 2 percent of your income. It cannot be more than 2 percent of your income. Moving up, if you earn between 150 percent and 200 percent of the poverty line, your premium can be 4 percent to 6.3 percent. Uh, of your income. Up to 400 percent of the poverty line, it can only be 9 percent. So the more you move up, the higher premium you have to pay. So two singles would be able to earn $43,000 and have help from the Federal Government with their premiums. But if they got married and combined their earnings to $86,000, they would be far above the limit because they would be above 400 percent of the poverty line. As a married couple, the most they could earn and still get government help with health insurance premiums would be $58,000, which is a difference of almost $30,000 or 32 percent. And this is a substantial disincentive to get married. Such marriage penalties exist even for couples below the poverty line when they are married. So if we look at the example of June and Jake, for example, living alone, each one earns, say, $21,780 putting them at 200 percent of the poverty line. 
unmarried, their premium would be about 6.3 percent of their income, or $2,744 in total. But let's say June and Jake were to marry. Their combined income would be $43,560, about 300 percent of the poverty line for a family of two. That would push their premium close to 9.5 percent uh, of the bracket, or $4,138 out of their combined income. That's a marriage penalty equal to about uh, $1,200, which is a substantial disincentive to getting married. The penalty also exists for single mothers. Say Sally is a single mother earning $44,130, putting her and her baby at the 300 percent of the poverty line. They would be eligible for the health insurance premium assistance credit. But what if she were to marry Sam, the father of her child, who earns $43,560 and who is at 400 percent of the poverty line? Their total earnings at $87,000 would exceed the 400 percent poverty line for a family of three. Married, they would no longer help, help, uh, get help with their premiums from the government. Unmarried, they would. So uh, I would argue that even though health care is something that every American should have, the way we have structured the program provides a disincentive to marry, and when couples are married, a disincentive for the woman to work. And this needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bert Scott Roth. Uh, Dr. Burkhouse. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to submit a summary of my research with Sean Lyons and Coastley Simon on the Affordable Care Act. In a series of proposed rules, the Obama administration confirmed what the ACA's supporters have feared. The law's requirement that employers must make health insurance coverage affordable only applies to single coverage, not family coverage. Those familiar with all the law's moving parts know exactly what this means. Because any offer of single employer coverage if it is considered affordable, blocks access to generous subsidies via tax credits in the insurance exchanges. Millions of families uh, will be stuck in a no man's land without affordable coverage through either their employers or the exchanges. The law's advocates are pushing the administration to change this by requiring employers to make coverage affordable for employees and their families. But our new research demonstrates why this decision isn't so cut and dried. Using this broader ACA definition of affordable could incent millions of employees to willingly shift from an employee plan to a government subsidized insurance exchange at significant, significant cost to the taxpayers, even if their employers continue to offer coverage. How the ACA's provisions will actually impact the insurance market depends on the answers to two questions. First, does affordable coverage refer to coverage just for employees alone? or for the employees and their families. We suspect the administration's proposed answer to the first question came as a surprise to the average congressperson who believed, as we did at the start of our research, that the law levies a fine if a large employer doesn't provide affordable coverage to employees and their families. But a close reading of the bill shows that the employer fine is only triggered when coverage isn't affordable for the employee, not the employee and their family. That brings us to the second question, which interacts in important ways with the administration's answer to the first. Will employers keep their current insurance plans but adjust them to allow lower or moderate income families, up to $89,000 for a family of four, to qualify for entry into the subsidized exchanges? The CBO, the CBO assumed not, yet for income eligible employees, subsidy dollars will make exchange coverage more affordable than their current employer plan, even when purchased with after tax dollars. It is attract, also attractive for employers who would pay less in per employee fines than by providing affordable insurance in the first place. By increasing pre-tax health insurance premiums, making coverage unaffordable for some, employers will free their lower to moderate income employees to actually obtain subsidized exchange coverage and still maintain their plan for higher income workers. We use Census Bureau data to, modify, to model the impact of the health care law on the sources of insurance coverage among private sector workers. Assuming the three main insurance provisions of the ACA take effect and the administration's definition of affordable sticks and people act as the government assumes they will, we find that employer-sponsored coverage will rise slightly from its current levels to about 75 percent and in response to the ACA mandates and by another 11 percent via the previously uninsured workers taking advantage of the exchanges. However, when we alter our model by allowing employees and employers to work together to take advantage of exchange subsidies, the picture changes. Employer-sponsored coverage falls to 70 percent. The number of employees insured in the exchanges rises by about 4 million to 16 percent. This all occurs despite our very optimistic assumption that all large firms actually offer coverage and no small firms drop coverage. But if we allow the broader interpretation of the employee mandate, that is, where employers must make coverage affordable for workers and their families, 
the changes are even more dramatic. Employer-sponsored coverage drops to 63 percent, with nearly one quarter of all workers, over 14.7 million or 23 percent, receiving their insurance through the exchanges. We offer no unique insight on whether the administration's proposed single coverage rule will hold, but we, don't, we do know that this unpopular definition and its possible revisions hold significant implications for everyone impacted by the law's provisions. Either millions of dependents of employees with affordable single coverage will be stuck without an offer of affordable coverage, we estimate between 7 and 16 million, or taxpayers will be stuck with as much as 50 billion more per year in gross subsidy costs than originally projected. This is a Sophie's choice embedded in the ACA as a consequence of the pile of open-ended taxpayer money it leaves on the table in the form of exchange subsidies intended for the minority, 20 percent of workers without affordable coverage that will inevitably tempt a significant number of the vast majority of employees with affordable coverage to gain access to it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, Dr. Berkhauser. Uh, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this invitation to testify on the premium tax credits that are available to families under the Affordable Care Act. Recent trends in the numbers of people who are uninsured or underinsured demonstrate how critical these premium tax credits and the laws related insurance affordability programs and reforms will be to ensure both the health and financial security of working families. The number of people without health insurance climbed to nearly 50 million people in 2010, over 13 million more than were uninsured a decade ago. Among people who do have health insurance, the Commonwealth Fund estimates that in 2010, 29 million working age adults had such high out of pocket costs relative to their income that they were underinsured. This is an increase from 16 million in 2003. Both these trends have had serious financial and health consequences for families. An estimated 75 million adults under age 65, both with and without health insurance, reported a time in 2010 when they did not get needed health care because of the cost, and 73 million adults said that they had difficulty paying medical bills or were paying off debt over time. With its array of affordable health insurance programs and new consumer protections, the Affordable Care Act will substantially reverse these trends, ensuring that all Americans will have access to affordable and comprehensive health insurance coverage. Indeed, the law's new provision that allows children up to age 26 to stay on or join their parents' insurance policies reversed a decade-long increase in uninsured rates of young adults, providing coverage to nearly 800,000 19 to 25-year-olds in, in the past year. The law's most significant coverage provisions will begin in 2014 with a substantial expansion in Medicaid eligibility for adults earning up to 133 percent of poverty or about 29,700 for a family of four, as well as subsidized coverage available, private coverage available through new state insurance exchanges for families earning up to 400 percent of poverty or 89,400 for a family of four. The state insurance exchanges will create a new marketplace that will serve as a central portal through which people can get coverage if they do not have an affordable employer-based health plan. People will fill out one application for all insurance affordability programs, including Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, the Basic Health Program, or premium tax credits for private plans, which are known as qualified health plans sold in the exchanges. Taxpayers eligible for premium credits will make contributions to their premiums as a share of their income from 2 percent to 9.5 percent percent. Those eligible for tax credits will have a choice of private plans that will offer an essential benefit package. Insurers will offer these plans at four levels of cost sharing, bronze plans covering an average of 60 percent of someone's annual medical costs, silver 70 percent of costs, gold 80 percent of costs, and platinum 90 percent of costs. The average cost covered by the silver plan will be increased for low and moderate income families. As an example, a family of four with an income of $35,000 would make a premium contribution of 4 percent of their income, or $1,400. If the policyholder's age is 40, this family's premium for a benchmark plan, which would be the second lowest cost silver plan offered in the family's region of the country, would be about $12,130 in 2014. The tax credit, their tax credit would thus be equal to the benchmark premium <coughs> minus their required contribution, or $10,700. About 90 percent of legal residents who are currently un uninsured in the United States right now would gain premium tax credits or Medicaid. In addition, if the reforms were implemented today, there would be 21 million fewer underinsured adults in the United States. 
The Congressional Budget Office estimates that the Affordable Care Act will reduce the federal de deficit by $124 billion over the period 2012 to 2021. Cutler, Davis, and Stremicus estimate even greater savings than the Congressional Budget Office from the law's health care delivery system reforms. They project an additional $406 billion in savings by 2019 and consequently a much greater net decrease in the deficit of about $400 billion. In 2009, as health reform was being debated, total national health expenditures were project projected to reach $4.9 trillion in 2020. Expenditures are now projected to reach $4.6 trillion in 2020, 5 percent below original estimates. If scorekeepers were to redo the original estimates based on these new projections, the deficit reduction generated by health reform would be even greater. The trends in uninsured and underinsured Americans over the last decade really do underscore the need for Federal and State policymakers to continue their work implementing the Affordable Care Act. When the law is fully in implemented, U.S. families will have new affordable and comprehensive insurance often, uh, options both in good economic times and in bad. In addition, while much of the recent debate has focused on lowering the cost of Medicare and reducing the Federal deficit, the same forces that are driving up public program costs are also increasing costs for working families. With this extensive set of delivery system and insurance market reforms, the Affordable Care Act in focuses on improving quality and affordability throughout the entire health care system. For the 50 million adults and children who without, without coverage in 2010 and the additional 29 million adults who are underinsured, the 2014 reforms cannot come soon enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, Dr. Holtz, you can, uh, recently I was privileged to be on a committee where you spoke uh, or testified uh, more globally about the, the state of our fiscal health. At, as a nation. Uh, can, can you go back into that with specific reference to health care costs and how the cost of health care uh, will impact our uh, fiscal state in the, in the near and long-term future? Well, I, certainly if you, if you go back to the beginning of this year and look, for example, at the, the administration's budget, um, it showed we are we're running a deficit this year about $1.3 trillion. Uh, but if and that is in and of itself troubling. Uh, and our current uh, gross debt relative to GDP is, is over 90 percent, and that is the, the uh, region in which the evidence suggests you pay a growth penalty of 1 percent uh, per year, but roughly, and have a much higher probability of encountering uh, international sovereign debt problems. So that is where we are. If you roll the clock forward 10 years in that budget, uh, assume that we are not fighting any overseas military operations financial crisis, distant memory, we are back to full employment, we are growing nicely. Deficit is still $1.2 trillion in that budget projection, $900 billion of its interest on previous borrowings. We are spiraling uh, out of control. This is true despite the fact that revenues are up to 19.5 percent of GDP above the historic norm. The administration raises all the taxes they want in that budget. And that tells you that we have a spending problem. And if you look inside that spending problem, it is driven by Medicare, Medicaid, and, and uh, soon the, the Affordable Care Act. And that that has to be the focus in controlling our future debt increase and, and the, the threats that it that, that faces the United States with. Nothing that has happened since that budget really changes that picture. The, the Budget Control Act in August puts discretionary spending caps on. Uh, they will be as effective as future Congresses uh, are effective with living with them. We haven't touched any of the mandatory spending programs, which are at the heart of that problem. And so I, I view it as inescapable that uh, this committee and the Congress as a whole will be back to look at that whole array of uh, Federal health programs again and again. Dr. Holtzik, and I know you are going to be reluctant to do what I ask you to do because it will um, uh, make you assume that you are a member of Congress and our public approval rating I must is such decline, sir. <laughs> that you probably will not accept my invitation. But what should the tax treatment be for health care? How, how would you reform it if you were king for the day? Uh, well, I have been on record for, for years as uh, removing the, ex the exclusion from tax of employer-sponsored health insurance. Uh, it is a perverse subsidy that, uh, number one, diminishes the awareness of consumers of health insurance to, to its real cost. Number two, the subsidy is uh, bigger for higher-income individuals, so it is at odds with conventional American notions of equity. And um, uh, I would eliminate that. And instead, to the extent that 
we wanted to support the purchase of uh, private health insurance in the United States, I would provide low income support and a fixed credit uh, that didn't vary by income and which didn't have this uh, open ended subsidy aspect. Ms. Uh, Furchcott Roth, I was struck, as I'm sure all of us up here were, unless they had heard it before, about the uh, systemic penalty for marriage that is, that is, I'm sure, inadvertently, unwittingly built into this law, but nonetheless, it is, it is there. Um, were there other examples you could give? I, I was just struck by June and Jack, I believe it was, that their, their decision to get married is going to have a deleterious impact on their, on their bottom line. That fact alone is going to cause their health care costs to go up. Are there other examples that you would have given had you had more than five minutes, or were those the most uh, probative? Those are, uh, those are the most uh, salient uh, examples, but uh, what I was going to say is that it also gives an incentive if the couple gets married for one of them not to work, and usually it is the woman who uh, decides not to go back into the labor market. About 80 percent of women have children at some point in their lives. They tend to go in and out of the labor market, and if there is this big penalty on their earnings. In other words, if the family says, okay, uh, June, you go back to work, but then we are going to lose government help with our health insurance, then the big incentive on top of the extra tax penalty is for the woman to drop out of the labor force and not work. And with the higher taxes in Europe, we have seen that there are lower levels of female labor force participation. Here in the United States, we have some of the highest levels of labor, women female labor force participation. Uh, women have invested in their education. They plan to have uh, many years with productive jobs. And this uh, marriage penalty uh, would basically throw them for a loop. I, I want to uh, follow the same admonitions I gave everyone else, and my time is up. So I would recognize the uh, distinguished gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I always say you can't lead where you don't go, and so, so I appreciate <laughs> very much your approach to uh, the timing. Uh, Dr. Hose Aiken, I, I was somewhat fascinated by your uh, testimony, and I, I was wondering as I listened to you, if people are living longer, using emergency rooms less frequent, using tertiary care, which is very expensive because the state of their health has gotten to the point where they need this kind of care. I was trying to figure out how those factors would be detrimental to our economy and, and how those would be negative as opposed to positives. Could you respond to that? Well, as in any policy uh, issue, uh, there are benefits and costs to the legislation and in uh, the health care issue in general. Um, it is certainly the case that we want a high-quality health care system and Americans living in better health and longer. No one disagreed with that at the outset of the debate. I think the, the issue is, um, does this legislation meet the objectives we want in terms of delivery system reforms? My judgment would be no, that it will not, in fact, uh, solve some of the problems we see in the delivery of American medicine that leads us to have a very low-value system. We spend a lot of money with, with very substandard results. Um, that we can have a longer discussion about why I think that. And then the second question is uh, the financing. And in the process of financing that, uh, that consumption of health care, do we do it in an efficient fashion that allows us to meet other objectives for economic growth and, and other policy objectives? And again, my judgment is this approach, which essentially wrote uh, you know, a trillion dollars worth of checks and uh, raised $500 billion of taxes and pretended to cut $500 billion out of Medicare isn't going to meet that objective. And so I think there was at the beginning of 2009 a shared understanding of the need for health care reform, a shared understanding that the objective should be higher quality care at lower cost and, and an efficient insurance system. 
I just don't think we met those objectives. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Furchant Roth, have you ever known anyone to not get married because they were concerned about um, the cost of health care or how it would impact them? And as a result, they would decide, well, you know, I'm not going to get married uh, because this is going to have a negative impact on my being. Have you ever known anyone to? Uh, well, the provisions, uh, the answer to your question is no, but the provisions of this Health Care Act have not yet kicked in. Now, say, two young people who, uh, first of all, they don't have the mandate to have uh, health insurance. There are people who are uninsured for short periods of time between jobs. You can buy a low-cost health insurance program right now with a high deductible and a health savings account and catastrophic health care. Uh, so this hasn't arisen right now, but it will if the government mandates expensive health insurance, requires people to have it, and gives people subsidies depending on where they are in the poverty line. Because the poverty line for one person is $10,890, but for two people is $14,710. Well, let me ask you, are the marriage rates going up or down? Uh, I would have to check those data and get back to you, and I would be happy to do that. Um, let me ask you, Dr. Collins, um, why do you think overwhelmingly people feel a need to reform our approach to health care and what we have been doing? I think the, the major motivation for the Affordable Care Act was to cover the 50 million people who are without coverage. That number has been growing over time. And we also know that that rising health care costs are making it increasingly difficult for employers to offer coverage. So more employers have dropped coverage, particularly small employers um, have, have, have dropped coverage over the last, uh, last few years. In this recession, we know that high unemployment rates are related to people losing their coverage through their jobs. About 50 percent, 57 percent of people who lost a job with health benefits became, became uninsured. And the other major um, piece of this is also addressing the underlying cost growth in the health care system. Half of the law is really directed at significant delivery system reforms that will achieve the kinds of cost savings um, that Mr. Holtz-Eakin uh, mentioned that are necessary to bring our deficit under control. And, in fact, if you see the Congressional Budget Office estimates, that in fact, over 10 years does reduce our deficit um, in large part because of those, those reforms. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman from, from Illinois. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, panel, for your testimony today. Um, I guess after listening to the testimony here and uh, prior to coming to Congress in January being a practicing primary care physician for 20 years, I would maybe start with uh, Dr. Collins and say, what makes the Affordable Health Care Act affordable? There are several insurance coverage expansions that will make coverage far more affordable for people than, than is the case today. So most people who try to buy on their own, as was mentioned earlier, don't actually end up buying a health plan through the individual market because they are underwritten on the basis of their health, and they actually face the full, the full premium. Their condi health care conditions can be excluded um, from their coverage. So the new uh, Medicaid expansion will dramatically increase coverage um, for people, as well as the premium tax credits, increasing coverage for people up to 400 percent of the of the poverty line. Um, Jonathan Gruber um, did an analysis that he published in May that looked at, looked at how much, whether, whether, whether health care would become more affordable for people. And the majority of people in the United States would find premiums and their out-of-pocket out of costs affordable under the, under the Affordable okay, Care who, Act. Who is going to eat the cost? I mean, it isn't free to provide health care. You said 50 million uninsured, 70 million uninsured. I think the President talked about 30 million uninsured when this came into effect. So I guess it has grown by 20 million in the last year and a half. Uh, who is going to pay for that? Where is that money going to come from? Who, who are they going to take it from? Well, there are, se the, there are several offsetting um, provisions in the law that do, that do pay for the expansion completely and, in, and in fact, save money over time. So the time. taxpayer then? I mean, the government doesn't have any revenue other than tax, so the taxpayers are going to pay for it? 
the, the provisions in the law require, require, um, re require changes to the delivery system, changes to Medicare Advantage plans, bringing them more in line with, with, regular, with, regular, with regular Medicare. Do you think health care is going to improve, or is the quality of care going to go down? The quality of care with, with the, under the provisions of the law are absolutely expected, is as, absolutely expected to increase. The delivery, so? system, the delivery system reforms are actually directed not only towards saving money, but also incre improving the way in which people receive their care, making the system more patient-centered, focusing on coordinating people's care over their, over, over, over their lifetime and over a disease, over a disease experience, um, so bringing much more rationality to the system than is the case today. I think, uh, Dr. Holtz-Egan, I think you said Medicare is, is maybe one of the worst examples of uh, management of an entitlement program. I certainly think it's a, uh, it, it's a clear fiscal problem. We know that. I mean, right now, the gap between premiums and payroll taxes coming in and spending going out is $280 billion a year. It is going to get worse, not better. Uh, it also promotes uh, uh, a lot of bad medicine. We have uh, a Part A for hospitals, a Part B for doctors, a Part C for insurance companies, a Part D for, for uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, it is not integrated in any way. It is not coordinated around a beneficiary. It is, uh, you know, hospitals are paid a fixed amount for a diagnosis. Doctors are paid for volume. Doctors practice in hospitals. The conflicting incentives are enormous. So I think reforming Medicare should have been the top priority, not something that was left behind. Yeah, and right now, as, as uh, Medicare patients will tell you, it is getting harder and harder to find primary care doctors. And so uh, I guess you are disagreeing with Dr. Collins that, uh, you know, where she says we can add more and more people to uh, Medicaid, and yet we are going to maintain a quality of care and somehow we are going to reduce cost. I, the, the Medicaid expansion is the most problematic, in my view. Medicaid beneficiaries are in ERs for normal care at far higher rates than are the uninsured, and they have a great difficulty finding primary care physicians. And to expand that program rather than fix that, I think, was an enormous mistake. So, you know, I just want to say on the affordability issue, there is a fundamental problem with uh, a country that, that spends nearly 20 percent of its national income on health care and defines care to be affordable when it is under 10 percent. That can't add up. And I, I don't think people in general want to look at it like a uh, better homes and garden, good, better, best health care. I mean, everybody wants the best, but it, the best costs money. And uh, we are saying this is an Affordable Health Care Act, but yet we are trying to increase the number of participants and we are trying to decrease the cost. Someone is going to have to pay for it. Ultimately, it is going to be taxpayers, it is going to be on the burdens. Uh, you know, physicians, we have an SGR problem right now for physicians where they are trying to cut another 29 percent from physician pay. As a primary care physician, uh, I don't set my own fees. That was set by Medicare over a decade ago. We have not had an increase in 10 years, and they are proposing a 10-year freeze. I don't know what the incentive is going to be to other physicians to go into medicine to help expand this improved quality of care that Dr. Collins spoke of. But my time has expired, and I thank you for your input. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Collins, um, it is not just a question of being affordable. It is also a, a question of being available. Is, is that right? I mean, this, this is what the health care, affordable care law is trying to make health care available because there are so many Americans that don't, even if they could afford it, it is not available. I have people in my family who could not even get an insurance policy if they were willing to spend $50,000 a year because of preexisting conditions. And we talk about women and we look at the, I think there was some research done that showed uh, women having far more preexisting conditions uh, than, than men. And then we also found that um, if a woman has a, a woman-owned firm, she is going to spend a lot more money on women in that firm uh, than, say, if a firm were, say, 50-50 male-female. Is that right? That is, that, is, that is absolutely correct. And the, right now, if, if a woman goes to the individual insurance market to buy a health plan, as, as was mentioned, if they lose their job or if they are between, between jobs, those plans generally do not come with maternity benefits. So insurers will not cover maternity um, because it is a cost to them. So under the Affordable Care Act, insurance plans will be required to offer, offer maternity coverage. Um, for small businesses, the law is 
very much geared towards making it much easier for small businesses to offer, to offer coverage. The, mandate, the, the requirement um, on the penalties that was mentioned, mentioned earlier only applies to companies with more than, 50, more, more than 50 employees. Employers can come into the exchanges, have a much broader array of health plans to offer their employees at likely lower costs. So these are, these are very much geared towards both improving women um, who are buying individual coverage on their own and women who own small businesses and are trying to, trying to do the best thing for their employees. In my, in my district, in the real world, about 40 miles away from here, uh, we often see people um, very sick, uh, ending up in the emergency rooms, uh, Mr. Holtz Egan. Um, and I think one of the aims of the Affordable Care Act was to try to zero in on wellness as opposed to treating people after they are sick. We need a new, we need a new normal in this country, uh, trying to help. See, some people think that the only time you uh, go to a doctor is when you are sick, or when you should go to a doctor when you are sick. Sometimes you need to go so that you can stay well. And I think one of the major aims of all of this is to try to keep people well. Is that right, Dr. Collins? Absolutely. And you see that in the provisions of the law, one of which went into effect last year. There is no Insurers have to cover preventive care um, with no cost sharing. Very little increase in premiums as a result of this provision, but will affect millions of, of people who, who get coverage right now. We want people to go to the hospital when they are sick, or we want to get people to get primary care when they're, before, they, before they get sick. So the, the law is absolutely directed towards encouraging that. It is very, very um, troubling that in, in, over the recession, people who have lost their jobs um, have gone without insurance coverage. 70 percent, more than 70 percent, have said they didn't get needed health care because of cost, including filling a prescription because of cost. Um, so we really want to change um, those incentives in the system, making it much more um, available to people. Thank you. Now, Dr. Holtz, again, your, your written testimony characterizes CBO's conclusions that PAPACA will result in budget savings as, quote, misleading, that's page 5, and, quote, dubious, unquote, uh, page 4. You were once the director of CBO. You oversaw scoring on many bills. Is it your testimony today that CBO did something wrong or violated any of the principles of budgetary scoring in coming to its conclusion that the PAPACA would generate a budget savings? Uh, is, that your, is that what you are saying? A absolutely not. Okay. Well, isn't it true that you would have likely concluded a budgetary savings given the same facts and same bill language? Had you been CBO director when the PAPACA was scored? Had Congress directed me the way they directed the current CBO, I, I would have received the same uh, bottom line. D Dr. Collins, whether we like it or not, we, we have to live by the rules. And the rules of budgetary scoring led the CBO to conclude that PAPACA will, will generate budget savings. Uh, have you heard anything today to cast doubt on the validity of the CBO's conclusion that the PAPACA would result in significant budgetary savings? I have not. And if anything, um, Congressional Budget Office is very conservative in their estimates. Other estimates have actually shown much greater cost, cost savings as a result of the delivery system reforms that we talked about earlier. So um, da um, David, David Cutler and colleagues have found an additional $400 billion in savings as a result of the, of the um, delivery system reforms. So if anything, the Congressional Budget Office estimates are, are conservative. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman uh, from Maryland. The Chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, the uh, Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Dr. Gozar. Dr. Holtz Eakin, um, what is the current state of Medicaid, the Medicaid program, and can it handle uh, an additional 20 million individuals coming onto these programs? Uh, the, at, at the moment, um, you could think of Medicaid as essentially all deficit financed at the Federal level, and States are struggling to meet their current obligations in Medicaid given their budgets. And to expand it, uh, I, I think the Governors have said quite clearly, is something they do not want to have to do. So really when we are talking about this health care system, the biggest problem was the Federal Government. Now, I mean, I'm a practice, I was a practicing dentist um, out in a very poor area of, of, of this country, actually one of the, the poorest districts in the country. And to, my, to the ranking member, I do know people that will get a divorce to stay together to make the rules work. Um, I do know that, and it's all too often. I mean, we're rewarding a bad behavior, um, and I want to address that in a minute. But 
Part of the problem is the Federal Government, because I see my colleague over here who's all fees and all insurance rates were based off of insurance uh, reimbursements by the Federal Government. They are they're part of the problem. And I keep bringing up that the group of people that have been on uh, government health care the longest are the ones that are rebelling the most. It happens to be our Native American friends. They can't stand it. They want off. Because what we have done is we have institutionalized away from what Ms. Collins, Dr. Collins said, is, and she made reference that when you are sick you go to the emergency room. Because what we did is we didn't reimburse the primary care physicians. We, 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 we extorted these, these numbers. Um, I think Mr. Um, Dr. Burkow, Burkhauser, I think you hit the nail on the head, is that this plan is based on unplausible applications. It doesn't fit the normal dynamics of the way life on Main Street America actually works. Common sense applications were thrown out the, at the wall. We have a lot of cost shifting going on that uh, Dr. Holtzi was talking about. Do you believe that the government takeover of health care will result in millions of additional workers who don't prefer ESI and will ask their employer to either drop their ESI or make their personal contributions unaffordable? Uh, yes, that is exactly what will happen. What we have is an opportunity for workers who currently have ESI to get much cheaper uh, coverage on the exchanges. So this bill really is uh, going to dramatically change the way health care insurance is provided in the United States. You are going to get some very weird outcomes. Because the uh, affordability is based on single coverage, uh, single, uh, people who are employed by firms who are providing them with uh, uh, affordable single coverage are going to beg their employers to increase the cost of their single coverage so that they can get their families onto the exchange. Because right now, if you have affordable single coverage but unaffordable uh, family coverage, you are in a no man's land. You neither have affordable coverage from your ESI or, and you are barred from the exchanges. So you're, the, this is an effort by a bunch of economists like myself in a little room trying to figure out the way the world works and trying to, uh, do, uh, to uh, square the circle. They are trying to provide uh, affordable care to people who don't have ESI coverage, which is about 20 percent of workers, and not affect everybody else. That can't be done. And we are going to see dramatic changes in the way health insurance is provided because of the perverse rules that we have in the system. Wonderful. Uh, and that would have something to do with um, the recent decision. Uh, we see these dynamics playing out with the Walmart decision. Wouldn't you say that? Yes, I think the Walmart decision is the beginning of a reevaluation by all empl large employers on exactly how they are going to respond to uh, the new incentives that are set into the uh, ACA. So uh, Walmart now realizes that uh, there is no reason to provide uh, uh, affordable health care to their part-time workers. The part-time workers can go and get uh, the, uh, uh, large subsidies on the exchanges. They will probably change their uh, uh, system for uh, all workers and actually increase the uh, uh, percentage of the Walmart health care that is provided by their workers so that those workers will also therefore not have affordable coverage and can go to the exchanges while at the same time allowing their higher income workers to maintain a Walmart uh, health care insurance. Thank you. Um, real quick, uh, uh, Dr. Fargotten Roth. Um, there is a ripple effect in broken homes and single families, um, the dysfunctional family. And, and what we are trying to create is the benefit of a, a broken a family. There is higher costs associated with dysfunctional families. Um, do you think the tax code should punish marriage, uh, be neutral towards marriage, or encourage marriage? I think, that, uh, I think the tax code should encourage marriage. And the marriage rate. Uh, over the past decade has actually gone down uh, from 8.2 per thousand in 2000 to 6.8 per thousand in 2009, the latest data available. So with marriage going down, according to the Centers for Disease Control, it is even more important to support and encourage uh, marriage that makes healthier families, makes smarter children, because it is easier for two parents to manage children than one parent to manage children. Thank you. My time is up. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The temptation for a second round of questioning is enormous, given the uh, talents uh, and acumen of our panelists. 
However, we want to be good stewards of your time, and votes are imminent, and we are not going to make you wait on us to vote. So uh, with that, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your uh, collegiality towards one another, your uh, perspective, your expertise, and uh, with that, the committee is adjourned.